of a passage in Scripture in Luke chapter 1. In verse 79, it's part of a song. And it's God's light will shine in our darkness. He will even shine in, for people who are living in the shadow of death. And God guides our feet in the path of peace. You know that we worship a God of peace. And He wants to give us His peace. And guide us on this path of peace every day. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, thank you for your great love for us, and we are in wonder and awe as we think about your birth, Jesus, and we know it's holy ground. And then also, Lord, we know that this time of the year can be so difficult for so many people, so we pray for your comfort and your presence for people who are lonely or hurting and confused right now and just feeling trapped or in major stress. Lord, would you come in with your love and your grace today and just flood our hearts and souls and minds, and we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean to go deeper with God? And is that something that you want? Mary and Joseph are about to go there. And as you think about going deeper with God, it's a phrase a lot of people use. What we see with Mary and Joseph is it is not primarily knowledge. Although knowledge is good and much truth is going to be revealed to them in a fresh way. But it's not primarily knowledge. It's not primarily serving. Although, again, serving is good, and new roles will be given to them. They are going to parent God. Can you imagine being assigned that role? If we had a table out in the lobby that said, uh, parenting God, who would like to sign up for that? <laughs> I think a lot of people would rather watch the reality show or maybe check out the podcast, but I'm not really sure about actually parenting God. That's part of their new role. And then what about events? Going deeper with God is not primarily about events. Although events are significant, and Mary and Joseph will walk through the most significant events in human history. So what is primary then? What's the main idea with going deeper with God? Here's the main focus today. Your new depth with God is trust. It is trust. And it is the only way to handle what's coming up in your life. What is coming up in the next year for you? Imagine getting in Mary and Joseph's shoes and looking ahead to what was going to be their next year. God is going to use you in tremendous ways, magnificent ways, new territory. But you know what? It's going to be a whirlwind. This next year is going to be a whirlwind. It is way bigger than you. There's going to be all kinds of unexpected stuff. And you know what? People who know you and love you, they're not going to really get all of that. They're not going to understand all of it. They're not going to be there to support you the way that you might desire. That's what's coming up for their year. What's coming up for your year? Would you still want to go deeper with God if you knew that was the year coming up? Well, they are going to go there. And we're going to take a look at a classic Christmas text, Matthew chapter 1. But our focus is going to be peace and really look through that lens as we dive into this text. And the key is, as you trust God more, there will be new experiences of peace in your life. And that's the only way to move forward, by really trusting God. We're going to take a look at God's prevailing peace, and how He prevails in the different situations of our life currently, and also what might be coming. And the tone of this passage is reassurance. Do you need any reassurance these days? Are you feeling rattled in any part of your life? This is a passage of great reassurance. So let's take a look at chapter 1 in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. God's peace prevails when your season of life becomes increasingly chaotic. Are you in a season right now that has become increasingly, maybe unexpectedly chaotic? December can be a chaotic month. And all we're trying to do is just celebrate Jesus' birthday. We're trying to celebrate that God came to earth. And you ever notice how hectic Christmas can get? Sometimes it feels like, why do we make everything so complicated? We're just celebrating that Jesus came to earth. Well, we're celebrating that fact. Imagine... Again, for Mary and Joseph, well, Jesus didn't just come to earth, but he's growing inside of your stomach. God is growing inside of your stomach. That's uh, amazing. And God is about to call you mom and dad. God calling you mom or dad. 
Yeah, that's the situation they're in. It's going to get very chaotic, and one of the things that's going to be affected is their relationship. Their relationship is going to have new highs and new lows. Have you had a relationship that has gone, you know, pretty well, but all of a sudden, in a new season, there's these highs and lows you've never had before in the relationship? That's what they're going to go through together. There's going to be more questions than ever, more unknowns than ever. No one has ever walked this road before. They're trailblazing. And then right before birth, they're going to have to literally make a road trip. And then there's no room in the inn and the, the smell of the manger and all this is happening. You say, well, that's chaotic, very chaotic. And I kind of wonder, don't you, if there were moments for Mary and Joseph where they just stepped back and maybe they just thought it, maybe they actually said it. But I kind of liked life more before God brought all these changes. <laughs> Our life was simpler. Our life was calmer. Before God started moving, it was just easier. And I kind of miss that. I kind of want to go back. Are you ever tempted to say, you know, I kind of want to go back. I miss before the changes. Life was easier before God started moving and taking over. And I think they were tempted to not trust God, but have that viewpoint. And think about the expectations for every Jewish girl and Jewish boy growing up. And they're thinking about marriage and what that would mean. Well, that culture was different. And marriage was more arranged. So parents would get together. They would set this up. There would be a contract. There would be a covenant. And then they were officially betrothed. That means they were husband and wife, much stronger than our engagement in our culture. But even though they were betrothed and considered family now, they had to wait one year. So the husband and wife would be apart for one year. And why would they do that? To really have a time of purity and faithfulness. To say, yes, I'm waiting and I'm pure and I'm looking forward to that day when we're going to be together. And then after one year, the husband would come over to the wife's house and there would be a procession, there would be a celebration, and with that, they would move back to where the husband is, and they would begin life happily ever after together. And that was the expectation, that was the hope of every Jewish girl and boy. And every time we talk about that cultural flow of marriage, I can't help but think about Jesus and our relationship to him. For God has arranged something, and he's created this covenant, and we are part of his family, we are the bride of Christ. And so accepted into his family, we're also uh, apart from our Savior right now. And he is in heaven and dwells there, but we are on earth. So he is going to come to our place. And we're waiting, and this is a time of faithfulness and purity. But he will come to us, and he will then re be reunited. There will be a procession in Revelation chapter 19. There's the wedding of the Lamb. And so don't miss it. The Jewish flow of a wedding is exactly what we're going through and what we look forward to. Eschatological is the end times, that's how it's playing out and all this has been laid out in scripture. But for Mary and Joseph it wasn't that, wow, this ties right into the Jesus and the big plan. Instead it was chaos. My hopes, my expectations, I wanted to look like this, I wanted to go like this, I wanted to flow like this, and now it's, it's not. It's just really not. Life was supposed to go that way and it really isn't right now. So they have all kinds of chaos. And what do you do when there's upheaval? Do you have any upheaval going on in your life right now? Maybe you're not even talking to other people about it, but it's internal upheaval. Well, I think back to what the prophet Micah said in Micah chapter 5. He was prophesying during a time of upheaval. Two exiles. First the ten tribes in the north, and then the two tribes in the south shortly after. Well, over a hundred years after. But two exiles... Three messages that Micah brings, and for all of them, he says, hear. He says, listen. His name means, who is like Yahweh. And what should we listen to? What's the message? He talks about the Messiah. And he says this regarding Jesus. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will will be their peace. Jesus is your peace. In the upheaval, there's only one place, one relationship. 
that's truly going to bring peace. Jesus is your peace. So what's weighing you down these days? Have you identified it? Do you know what it is? Maybe a top three things that are really weighing you down. Do you know what those are? How are you going to overcome those? And a lot of today we've been talking about an individual level of walking in the path of peace. But let's think on a worldwide level for a second. And uh, when you think about chaos and upheaval, what would you say is the greatest humanitarian crisis of the times we're living in right now? Worldwide, what is the greatest crisis? Probably the situation with refugees around the world. And so I grabbed some statistics from World Vision. There are 65 million displaced refugees, forced migration. Half of them are children living in poverty, uh, struggling with health issues, parents aren't around, working, not going to school, being abused. This is happening all over the world. 24 more refugees every minute. So just as long as I take, told you to you know, describe what's going on right here, 24 more refugees. And over half the refugees in the world have been refugees for over 10 years. So it's not like, oh yeah, we had to leave for a little while. Oh, but now we're coming right back. Over 10 years. And so where's the, the comfort? It's in God's grace. It's in God's character. And so Psalm 9, verse 9, says this. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. In Psalm 146, verse 9, the Lord watches over the alien, and he sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. God's character, his presence, brings us a peace in the middle of the upheaval, and it transcends whatever upheaval that we're going through. I also want to say that during this time that we're living in, millions and millions of people are turning to Jesus all over the world. So at the same time we have this refugee crisis, we're seeing this a revival and awakening that's astounding in our world. And what's interesting is so many people are kind of like, I don't know, so localized that it's kind of like, oh, there's a refugee problem going on in our world? Really? Uh, oh, God saving millions and millions of people turning to Jesus like never before in our world today? Really? That's going on? So on this macro level, these amazing things and upheavals are happening, and a lot of people are just really localized, kind of insular in their, in their own world. But um, you know who's turning to Jesus all over the place? People who grew up in the Muslim faith or tradition and culture are turning to Jesus. And you're seeing it in Africa. You're seeing it in India, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's, it's incredible what's happening. I was uh, looking at a story. There's a man named Daniel who's from the Ukraine, 26 years old. He was studying to be a medical doctor, a physician. And then God redirected his life. God does that sometimes. And uh, instead, going into ministry and serving refugees. So he's located in Iraq. And he's served hundreds of refugees there, um, gathered together. About 1,600 at most, currently 700. He knows all the refugees by name. He's just there to show God. So I'm 26 years old. He says, I was going to be a medical doctor, but God told me to be a spiritual doctor instead. Amen. So in the middle of the chaos, there is revival in our world. In the middle of the upheaval, there is great awakening in our world. And I just think, isn't this true with Mary and Joseph, incredible upheaval, but God is bringing salvation. You go through church history in the book of Acts, incredible upheaval and persecution, but the gospel spreads to the world. You look at the times we're living in now, and the refugee situation is just one example of incredible upheaval, and yet awesome awakening throughout the world. And so both of them do go together, and yet how do we respond to this? And I was taking comfort this week in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, where we're reminded, we think about our roles, and how do we live the fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. Quietness, confidence, in the middle of the upheaval, peace, doing what is right, knowing our roles, living that out. Joseph, in this passage, almost misses God's peace. He almost misses the path of peace. Have you missed the path of peace and realized, like, I am really not on the path of peace right now? Joseph almost took a wrong turn, and many people today can easily miss the path of peace during Christmas. Drop down to chapter 1, verse 19. We read, because 
Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace, he had in mind, he had in his mind, he set his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Here's the turning point of the text and the turning point in our lives. God's peace prevails when you realize you have formed the wrong plan. The wrong plan. Or you've formed the wrong assumption. Or you've formed the wrong perception. Or you've formed the wrong reaction to someone else. What do you do when you're off track? Well, Joseph got off track because... He was operating out of a fear-based place. Deuteronomy 22, there was the death penalty for those who were betrothed and one was unfaithful and would go find someone else and get pregnant with someone else. There was a death penalty in that culture. So Joseph feared. He thought about the judges at the city gates. He thought about what would happen to Mary and how she would be criticized, how she would be ostracized, how she would be killed. He, he imagined every scenario, and it was fear-based, and he was operating out of a place of insecurity. Do you know what your insecurities are? Are you operating out of insecurity? Are you operating out of fear? It very rarely works out well. It's very rarely golden when we're operating out of that place of insecurity. Now, his motive was great. To care for Mary. It was altruistic. He was thinking about Mary and what would be best and how he could protect her. But he had a lousy plan. You can have great motives and lousy execution and plan. It'd be like as if you went to a physician who really cared about you and was right there listening to you. But then your doctor gives you the wrong prescription. Gives you the wrong medication. I mean, I would rather have a doctor that is extremely competent that just had a good bedside manner. You know, and, and so with that, yes, he cares so much about Mary, but he's going to give out the wrong prescription. Joseph is truly heartbroken. And I want to say, be careful when you're heartbroken of what words come out of your mouth. Be careful about making big decisions when you're feeling heartbroken and crushed and disappointed. You know what? Poison can come out and you don't even realize it because you're just hurting and heartbroken and everyone else is seeing this is really not good, but you're just heartbroken and so it's coming out of a place of disappointment. That's how Joseph's feeling. And the Bible's very clear. There's the flesh and there's the spirit in Romans chapter 8. And we can say and do things out of the flesh. We can make perceptions and assumptions out of the flesh. But God says when we're led by the spirit and our mind is led by the spirit, it is a path of great peace and great joy. So as we go through life, we're going to be choosing each day, am I going to be led by the flesh or led by the Spirit? And one phrase that's so interesting in my experience as a pastor would be this phrase, well, I prayed about it and I have peace about it. And sometimes that's really good, but you know when I hear that often is when someone's doing something that totally contradicts what the Bible says. And they say, well, I prayed about it and I have peace uh, about it too. Well, if you prayed about it, you have peace about it, but it doesn't line up with God's word, <laughs> you know, how good really is it? And so there was a lot of confusion in Joseph's mind, and maybe you can relate, and ultimately, here's something that appeared to be awful, but was actually good. That's confusion. The virgin birth appeared to be something so awful, but it was actually good. And then what appeared to be good for Joseph was actually so awful. He thought divorce would be really good, a good solution. But actually, that divorce decision would be really awful. That's the definition of confusion. And what's really good appears awful, and what's really awful appears good. And we have a culture right now that is calling good, they're taking good and calling it awful, and taking things that are awful and calling them good. We just have a really, a lot of confusion in our culture. So, what do you do? And Joseph has all these emotions that are necessary, these thoughts that are necessary, these plans he's making that are necessary. How do you get back on track? Well, when we're off track, we have a God who's gracious, and he gets our attention. Amen? I know it's never happened to you before. It's just always been smooth for you. But, but really, uh, for those of us that can relate, been off track... God does it in a dream for Joseph. Five times in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. A dream. 
You know, so many people in the Middle East are turning to Jesus right now through dreams of Jesus, visions of Jesus. And then sometimes even saying a prayer to Jesus and seeing miraculous answers to prayer. God communicates to us in so many ways. He does it through dreams. He gets our attention. He's saying this is not the right direction. Joseph, appreciate the effort on the plan, but not the right direction. So how do we get back on track? I uh, had an interesting week. And uh, one of the things that happened was I got a call from my wife. And it was one of those calls where it was a serious tone. And she said, this is the reason I'm calling. So I knew, hey, pay attention, something happened. I have a picture of, well, that's her wedding ring right there. And uh, maybe you notice something's missing. That's like, not how it was presented to her. I went, dang. Yeah, the rock is gone. That's, that's pretty important. So she calls and shares as she has looked down and discovered that the diamond has fallen out of her wedding ring. And what do you do when the diamond falls out of your wedding ring? You can't take a metal detector and, and you can't just go around town because the ring is still on the finger. But there's a diamond somewhere around town missing. And so we prayed. And you start praying, Lord, please help us find this diamond. Uh, not just because of the value uh, financially, but that sentimental. And I'm not a super sentimental person, but this one got me. I'm like, wait, that's the wedding. That's our diamond together in our marriage. And so you start praying because you can't just say like, oh, I can just make this happen. So you pray for help because it could be around town. It could be in the front yard. It could be in the backyard. Chasing the puppy. It could be in a store. It could be anywhere. Where are you going to find a ring? So uh, the search began. And looking across the floor, you see something there? Kind of emerging, like a North Star. Uh, there it is. And so, wait, is that a crumb? Is that what's going on? So we get a closer look. And there it is. Praise the Lord. So my wife and, and my daughter, they see it, they are so excited, they, they find the diamond. It's just a tangible reminder that God restores, God's grace is good, uh, God cares. And, and with this, you know what happens now, that diamond will be placed in to the, the ring. Because there's really no warning. I mean, how do we know that it was about to fall out and give way? But now it will be placed, it will be more secure than ever before. That diamond will. So that's the next step in it. But I think about that process right there. When God wants to bring new peace, new experiences of peace in your life, some of them are going to be brand new experiences of peace. But other ones are going to be God restoring a peace that you had, but you kind of lost in the marriage, in a friendship, about your calling. Sometimes you had it at one point, but now it's gone. And God's going to help you find it. What do you do? You ask Him for help. You go look in and let God restore it and make it more secure than ever. If your marriage is going through a difficult time, we have marriage investors here, mentors, but if, if your marriage is going through a difficult time, just know God can heal and restore and make it stronger than ever. But you're going to need to pray and seek Him and submit to Him and truly let Him guide you as well. So uh, going through that, quite, quite a week, um, and I think back, you know, the, now the diamond's recovered, but uh, a heart at peace. In the book of Proverbs, it talks about a heart at peace. And it says in Proverbs 14, 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body. When your heart is at peace with God, it is life to your body. But envy rots the bones. If Mary and Joseph looked around and said, how come all the other couples, they don't have to deal with this huge upheaval. Envying other couples, it would rot their bones. And then here's a Christmas bonus proverb that ties into peace. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 1, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Better to have peace and quiet in the family and come together, even if we're just eating leftover breadcrumbs. But the relationships are good and God's here. That is so much better than the whole family getting together and having all the awesome food, but relationships are really strained and in a mess. So I, I share that, that perspective about peace, that God might use you to initiate with some healing. 
Maybe the whole thing isn't going to turn around this Christmas, but maybe you forgive someone. Maybe you call someone. Maybe you go out of your way. Maybe you give a gift. Maybe you invite someone over who's usually left out of the family. Maybe you care for someone who's hurting in the family. Be an instrument of God's peace during this Christmas time, during the upheaval as well. Uh, going back to the text, drop down to verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. God's peace prevails when your calling becomes unexpectedly difficult. When your calling becomes unexpectedly difficult, God's peace will still prevail. A lot of people ask the question from Matthew chapter 10, what does Jesus mean when he says, I didn't come to bring peace, but division? I mean, that sounds like an antithesis to this whole series. Jesus came to bring division, not peace. And then Jesus explains, there's going to be a father, but then there's going to be a son, and there's going to be some division. There's going to be a mom and a daughter, and there's going to be some division. There's going to be the in-laws, there's going to be some division. And what he's saying is that everyone's invited to this relationship with him. Everyone's invited to heaven. But in a biological family, some will say yes to Jesus, and some are rejecting Jesus currently. And there's going to be division in that sense within a family, and that's not easy to sort through. You know what Mary and Joseph are going to face? They're going to be raising the Son of God. Well, we've got one boy who claims to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And then we have other boys who don't think he is at all. And sometimes we kind of think he's a little extreme, so we're trying to figure him out too. And that's the dynamic in their family. Spiritually, they're going to be very divided for many years. And Jesus' own family and brothers are just not on board. They are not tracking Sure, he's a little better than us, but I'm not giving him the Son of God, Messiah. No way. And, and so they've got some of that. The calling is getting difficult. Carrying the Christ child. It's a metaphor for us for carrying the calling that God has on your life. What calling are you carrying? I'm almost surprised that... I think so many Christians have unspoken expectations about the calling and following Jesus. That overall, things will probably go pretty smooth. Hmm. That there probably won't be too many big surprises. That it probably won't get too difficult. I'll probably see everything coming. And you know what? I'm not going to have to rely on God that much. I can do most of it on my own. And it's like nobody says these things, but we operate in these assumptions. And it's like, yeah, and I think what I'll go through will be similar to what most people will go through. I just don't see that stuff in the Bible. I see pick up your cross daily. And in fact, the cost could be really, really high. Mary, yes, um, she's going to have Jesus. But you know when Jesus is murdered, do you know where Mary is? Three words, John 19, near the cross. She's up close watching her son murdered. I can't imagine one of my kids getting murdered. And then me having to sit there and watch it from up close. Mary, the cost is going to be really high in following Jesus. But Mary, I'm going to give you as much peace and reassurance as I can. And Jesus from the cross says, John, take care of Mary. That's your mom. Mary, you're with John. That's your son. And Mary gets some reassurance that all her days she's going to have someone looking after her because she's lost what looks to be her husband is gone. And now she's lost her son. Mary, the cost is high. The roller coaster, <laughs> the virgin birth, what does this mean? Okay, we're going to be looked at strange. No one's going to believe us. But we get to raise the Messiah to he's murdered, to he's risen. I mean, when they think the virgin birth is a challenge and it's hard to trust God through that, that's just a warm-up for the, the death of Jesus and the crucifixion. But we'll keep trusting him. And you know what? We're going to see that resurrection. And so they're on this journey, and sometimes I think we assume that the cost is going to be simple, it's going to be easy, it's going to be small. I want to say this so clear. The more people you're going to reach, the calling God has on you to touch lives, to serve people, to make a difference around the world, the more people you're going to help, the cost will be higher. And you can go through life and say, I'm just going to shrink the cost. 
not going to really have a big impact for God in this world, but I'm going to really shrink the cost. Or you say, you know what, the cost is high, but God's grace is sufficient. His peace will be in the middle of the upheaval. And let's go for this, Jesus. Let's go for it. What do you do when the calling that you're carrying gets very difficult? Well, Jesus didn't just come to help us help ourselves. Jesus came to be our Savior. Jesus came to be our Savior, not just for the forgiveness of sins, but in walking through the calling, in living every day, in daily grace, we cry out, Lord, save us, Lord, help us, Lord, we need you. We don't just need to help ourselves and let Jesus help us help ourselves a little more. We need a Savior every single day to help us through. So we rely on him, and uh, what's our role? You know, I think one of the big keys in peace it's your mind, your thinking. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about these things. If you want new peace in your life, it's going to mean new thinking in your mind. And so what are you thinking about? What's the content of your thoughts? And then as you think, then live it out. Paul says, put it into practice. What you know, what you've learned, what you're dwelling on, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So we do have a role, and God helps us in that role. Uh, how does it end up for Joseph and Mary? Look at verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. In the very same place where uh, Joseph was going to do his own thing, now in that very same situation, he is 180 degrees different, taking Mary home as his wife. He's teachable. He's responding to God. He's letting go of his wife. In your worship of God, my guess is that there's some things you need to let go of. Joseph will not go down the path of peace until he lets go of his original plan. Do you have some original plans, assumptions? Do you have some things that you're still holding on to? And you think, well, I'm going to hold on to it and I'm going to have God's peace. Well, no, Joseph has to let go of his original plan to have God's peace and walk down that direction with the Lord. But he does that, and that's a trust decision. And trust is at the crux of this. May the God of hope fill you with all peace as you trust in him. Trust in peace. Linked, your new depth is trust. The result will be peace. And the key word here is that word fulfill in verse 22. Uh, Matthew's going to quote the Old Testament so many times, 47 times, 12 times he uses this word fulfill. And fulfill refers to what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14. The virgin birth, Emmanuel, God with us. That was the word and that's what God faithfully brought, God with us. Take that in today, God with you. Mary is an overwhelmed lady. God is with overwhelmed Joseph is the dad that almost blew it, almost messed up the whole family. I mean, had a plan that he wasn't going to be around Mary and Joseph, was not going to be around Jesus. He almost blew the whole thing. God wants to come alongside of guys who really almost or have blown it. God with us. I know people say be careful around strangers. I just love strangers. I, I like getting to know him. I was in a store this week, and a man was on the job with security. And we started talking. He started sharing his whole story with me. And he said, five years sober, he was addicted to opiates. And he said the turning point was he came that close to losing his wife and his kids. God is with men who are addicted to opiates. Men who are on the verge of losing their wife and their kids. God can restore. God can rebuild. God is with you if you're feeling hopeless. God can, uh, again, restore the peace that's been missing. If you're feeling overwhelmed, God can bring peace right there. And ultimately, Joseph's going to find a new security. Mary's going to find a new security. I realize it's a bad pun after that last story. But 
this new security, so not operating out of insecurity and fear, and this new security is so important because they're going to move forward now saying, I don't care what the rest of the town thinks. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they say about us. We're walking in the security of the Lord, the path of the peace. We know this is God's son. We know it was a virgin birth. Have you been delivered from what people think about you oh, and trying to please everybody? Have you been delivered from that? Mary and Joseph have found a security that's going to deliver them from that. And they're going to move forward in true peace because they're walking with the Lord. Here's the take home. When God's plans do not initially appear to be peaceful or trustworthy, and often they won't, it usually signals that he is about to do something. With his virgin birth, it doesn't appear, initially appear like this is going to be peaceful for Mary and Joseph. And it might not even seem trustworthy. Joseph certainly doesn't trust Mary right away or the, the crowd. But you know what? Something special God was doing. So don't panic, don't fear. When it starts to look like this is unexpected, not so peaceful, I don't know if I can trust God. Just you to trust Him and just know He's about to do something special. New experiences of peace in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for uh, so many powerful messages through your birth, Jesus, that you bring into our hearts and where you met people then, like Mary and Joseph, you meet us today. And you reassure us with that message that God is with us, even though we waver and get unsettled and sometimes have doubts and want to run with our plan. God, you're with us, you're gracious. And Lord, you restore, you build new security, you build new hope, you build new peace. And Jesus, as we worship you together today, we pray that you continue your work through the Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't get in the way. And Jesus, we want to walk with you on this path of peace, for you are the Prince of Peace. We pray in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen.